Grabs Journal 7. If the river into the lake was kind to me, moving me carefully where I left the station wagon to the lintel of the sandbar, the stream out of the lake was playful. For one thing, it was narrow, about the width of a canoe. For another, it moved quickly. It twisted and snarled and backtracked all through a sort of pass between a group of hills. One minute the stream was so shallow that I couldn't paddle, even if I did know how. Then the sandy bottom would disappear suddenly into a deep, dark pool, usually on a bend. Occasionally there were log jams or boulders to avoid. The shore was sometimes crowded with bushes, sometimes grassy and swampy for about 50 yards to the trees, sometimes a graveyard of beech, bleached stumps. But I didn't have time to notice how creepy it all was. Through this scenery I tried, with almost continual failure, to control the canoe. I hated those long curves and sharp double back bends, the most because the current would always move me into the bend and push me into the bank. Then I'd have to struggle and heave and splash my way out of the backwater and into the straightaway below the curve. After it was easily a couple of hours of this bone grinding toil, I began to get a, a little of control, a little bit of control. It was during one of the many rest stops, uh, canoe jammed against a grassy bank by the current, that I decided I might as well experiment with my paddle to try and gain at least some control. I had nothing to lose, that's for sure. So I'd paddle easily in the straight sections, changing sides quickly. When Then when one of those frustrating curves came, I'd drag the paddle and try to steer. I found that by turning the paddle different ways, I could sort of rudder the canoe in roughly the direction I wanted. And by ruddering on different sides, I got even more satisfaction. It didn't work all that well. I still got trapped in backwaters and shoved around in the bends, and I still thumped logs and ground on gravel bars. Once I even dropped my paddle over the side while changing hands, barely managing to retrieve it. But things improved. The river began to widen, straighten, and slow down. Now, and the shoreline was not so hilly. Luckily, I needed the rest, and paddling was easier. Soon I was slipping, in a zigzag, of course, across, the hu across a huge beaver pond. The surface of the coffee-colored water was sprinkled with tired-out-looking lily pads. But I was far more weary than the plants. As long as I kept moving, my body stayed numb. But when I rested, the aches and pains started, and my muscles, apparently everyone in my body, everyone on my body, began to stiffen. Well, there'd be no rest for a while. At the far end of the pond was a beaver dam that spanned a natural rock cut about a dozen feet across. From the dam, the water dropped roaring about six feet over boulders and fallen tree trunks. If I remember right, from the trip with my father, the creek rushed and jumped through the bush for a quarter of a mile over many tiny falls. To get from the beaver pond to lake, you had to walk along a portage that followed the creek. I was glad to get out of the canoe, I'll tell you. My legs would hardly straighten, but I managed to stand up, clamber over the packs, and step out onto the little sand beach. It seemed like I hadn't felt land under my boots for a long time. I swiveled my torso a little and flapped my arms, then walked into the bush to take a leap. I returned to find the canoe being dragged from the beach toward the falls. I'd have to watch that. I admit I'd never done a day's work in my life before I escaped. Our house had electric this and power that. What work the machines didn't do alone, they helped with. And the servants did the rest. Clothes always arrived clean. Food always arrived cooked. Lawns were always mowed. We never walked where we could drive. And if we couldn't drive, we wouldn't go. We even hired someone to fix the machines if they got sick or died. So that portage, after many hours of paddling, was an ordeal completely beyond my experience. When my father and I did it, uh, we had much less baggage and a portage wagon, a sheet of plywood with a bicycle wheel underneath to help. All we had to do was pull the thing. I dragged the packs out of the boat and put them to the side. Then I hauled the canoe up onto dry land. I'd seen pictures of guys carrying canoes jaunting along happily through a natural wonderland, heads invisible, under the noble craft that rested lightly on their shoulders. Sure, you bet. Just try to get the damn thing up. I attempted everything from every direction, but the canoe just rolled out of my hands and fell to the ground with a hollow thump. Luckily, it was fiberglass. Then, in desperation, I rolled it onto one gunnel, crawled in under it, settled the center of the thwart on my shoulders, and staggered to my feet. Success, I had it off the ground, <laughs> until the front end slowly descended and thumped the ground, sending hollow echoes drumming into my ears. 
I slid my arms further forward on the gunwales and heaved, sending the bow skyward at great speed and ramming the stern into the dirt behind me. More echoes. Easy now, I thought. I adjusted the position of my hands again, pulled down on the gunwales and slowly raised the back, and then gingerly, because the balance wasn't good, I began to walk. A quarter of a mile isn't far, once around a track, a few city blocks, but when you're trying to balance a chunky, clumsy chunk of fiberglass and wood, whose weight is concentrated into a three-inch wide thwart across your already aching shoulders, while bumping over rocks and slipping in mud, a quarter mile is a journey. Not only that, it's a boring journey, because with the boat overhead, all you can see is a yard of ground in front of your toes. After a couple of forevers, I caught sight of the water through the bare trees and finally reached the lake. So as not to drop the boat, I knelt down on the gravelly shore and tried to ease out from under it. I ended up sort of rolling it off my shoulders as I fell sideways. I lay there for a while, panting, then sat up. The walk back through the open bush, mostly tall hardwoods, seemed heavenly in comparison. I could hear the brook racing over the mossy stones, birds telling their chirpy stories, my boots thumping on the dry ground or slicking through mud in, in the low spots. But it didn't last. Carrying the packs was worse than the canoe. Each of the big ones was heavier than the boat, and I packed them like a fool. They were shapeless blobs, like ripe grapes or water bags, except the food tins or equipment stuck sharp corners up. I probably looked pretty funny trying to get them on my back, one at a time, of course. I couldn't lift them on, so I tried a few experiments and ended up dragging a pack to a flat spot on the embankment, sort of half sitting, half leaning against it from below, slipping my arms in under the straps. I stood up and staggered off down the trail. Within two minutes, I decided to repack those bags first chance I got. Because aside from the leather straps cutting into the already tender muscles of my shoulder, cutting off the blood so that my arms began to buzz, all kinds of corners and ends of objects, mostly hard objects, dug into my back, like cruel fingers prodding me along. I put out more sweat on that portage in one go-round than I had in all my life up till then. After four trips, I was soaked. At the end of the last trip, I sat down dizzily and looked over out over the lake. A breeze had come up during the hour and a half. I was on the trail, and the lake had a bit of a chop to it. The cloud cover was lower, and the whole scene was gray and colorless. It was getting late, but I knew the campsite I was heading for was only a mile or so down the lake. My father and I had stayed there. Did I stay a little further? Well, maybe in a boat paddled by a skillful canoeist, but for old crab, landlubber from birth, another challenge because I had the waves to contend with. I'm not saying they were huge rollers. They were barely ripples, just enough to make the canoe roll a little off center as each one passed under me. I was traveling at right angles to wind and waves, and the breeze, just enough to flip my forelock every few minutes, was no help. The crab zigzag almost worked on flat, calm water with dead still air. Here I traveled in four directions at once, the zig, the zag, the gradual forward motion toward the campsite, and the sideways drift caused by the wind and wave breeze and ripple. It took another hour and a half, but I did it. I got to the place, a narrow rocky peninsula about 50 feet across the base and twice as long covered with pines. I groaned with relief when I heard the bow grind onto the rock of the shore. Climbing stiffly out of the canoe, I stood up and stretched as much as my muscles would let me. Then I dragged the canoe up on shore, manhandled the packs out and hauled them up the slanting rock onto a flat needle covered ground. I was worn out, beaten thin, and what I wanted was sleep. Soon I had the tent pitched, a little cockeyed but standing under a huge pine. And a few seconds after that, I crawled gratefully into my sleeping bag and took a long, graceful dive into the black well of sleep. If I'd known what was going to happen, I wouldn't have made that dive. So.